is brewing in South Dakota. Sorry to get that. Southwest 1772, right And it's moving swiftly into Minnesota, bringing with it rain, hail, thunder, and wind. A mass exodus is taking place from one social media website to another. But there's still some survivors left behind. Album shares, party pictures. This one doesn't look any different. The user is sent to a web page, and it's disguised in a coat that makes it look normal. But the last two letters reveal its true identity. They're prompted to install a video player update. This unsuspecting computer is now a zombie, connected to a mesh of other half-dead machines spread all throughout the planet. A botnet known simply as You are watching Disrupt TV. Congratulations, you won. Congratulations, you won. Congratulations. No, 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 yes. An antivirus company announces a discovery. Typically, URLs are hosted on a single web server through a single internet protocol address. If one is found to be malicious, it's fairly easy to chop it down from the root by blocking the IP. But these URLs are utilizing a tactic known as fast flux. In a fast flux network, the IP address of the domain name is constantly switched out, making it near impossible to find the core of the infection. Perfect for the first stage of self-propagation over the dates. In this time period, we see variants appearing that are created from the original MySpace exploit. Target Skype. Targets Twitter. Makes its way onto the Macintosh ecosystem. It spreads not only through social media messages, but right under our noses. An ordinary website. You can download files from here. Kubeface covers the otherwise safe download button with an HTML iframe. This sends a PDF file to the user that when opened, scans the computer. It's searching for a file transfer protocol. If found, it will send out a message to the other bots who will subsequently use the exploited username and password to make a new home within its victim. With each newly infected host, the botnet grows larger creating a decentralized, untraceable network that turns left, turns right, goes up, and goes down on the whim of whoever has the steering wheel. Dave, I'm just in the with how to protect your computer. Dave? Yeah, Ron, it's really scary how easily it can infect your computer. In fact, we had a computer expert show us... Show us, show us. It's 1997, and the most popular website in the world is... More than 17 million people use the site every month to explore a new frontier known as the internet. But at 7 p.m. on Monday, December 8th, Yahoo is hijacked. Confronts anyone who opens the browser. The message reveals that the computer of every single person who's visited Yahoo in the past month has been infected with a worm. And on Christmas Day, in less than three weeks, the bomb will detonate and destroy millions of contaminated computer systems. That is, unless the hijacker's one demand is met. Anger erupts, and over the following days, protests break out on the streets across the United States. They set up camp outside federal courthouses, and from New York to California, people call into radio stations to cry out the phrase, in real life 
and in video games. Do you have games. anything else to say? Yeah. Free Kevin! Oh. It's now just one week until Christmas, and most are asking. <laughs> Hoists himself up and looks through the bars on his windows. But Kevin isn't a terrorist. He isn't a mafia boss, and he's not here because he wiretapped the NSA or blackmailed FBI agents. Authorities say he poses an even greater danger. Because with a single phone call, they say, he can dial into the NORAD and access the nuclear arsenal of the United States of America. The event of nuclear weapons changed the course of the world. Kevin might only be an innocent prankster, or Kevin could be the world's most dangerous cyber terrorist, a man who has North America at his fingertips. To free or not to free, that is the question. This is a Windows Registry key. And this is that same Windows Registry key modified by Kubeface. When a computer wants to connect to a website, it goes through a domain management system, or DNS. This is typically provided by an internet service provider. A VPN circumvents this by building its own bridge that handles the traffic toward whatever website the user types in. Kubeface is doing something similar, but instead of directing traffic to the website in its true form, it repaints road signs, changes GPS directions, and guides the user to wherever it pleases. YouTube, Wikipedia, PayPal, all resolve to IP addresses employed by the Command and Control Center. This is how the Kube makes its money. Right there. When that user clicked the link, Kubeface instantly shot his browser through a number of affiliate advertising networks. Instead of the machine sending HTTP GET to Google, as it normally does, an infected machine sends HTTP GET to Kubeface, who responds with a list of affiliated links. It's only after receiving those links that the machine correctly sends HTTP GET to Google, who then returns with the legit results. The first result corresponds to the first affiliate link, and when clicked, for just a brief moment, an advertisement. After that process, the used affiliate link is scrubbed, and a new one takes its place. These systems may offer two bucks per a thousand users that click the affiliate link. Multiply that by hundreds of thousands of infected bots across the planet, clicking links all day, and at this point, Kubeface's command and control center is passively pulling in. The victim may now notice that something feels off. Their loading times are slower. Toolbars keep appearing out of nowhere. And just in time, a helping hand is offered. Similar to the Google search, a response is sent to Kube's command and control center. It responds with a list of antivirus software downloads, picks one, and displays it on the desktop. After the user pays, their PC remains infected, and Command and Control gets a paycheck. We live in a world of bots. But where do these soulless beings come from? Alan Turing, a 20th century mathematician, creates the Turing test. In the experiment, a human has a text-based conversation with a computer and another human. If he can't tell who is the computer and who is the human, then the computer has passed the test. Now we've flipped this. Instead of us, the human telling computers apart from humans, computer needs to figure out who's you and who's me 
and who is its robotic kin? So you are a robot? No, my name is Cliverbert. Yes, you are a robot and your name is Cliverbert. I am a robot. Yes, I know. Together we are robots. I'm not a robot. I'm a unicorn. In the beginning, Coopface uses a small portion of manually created accounts to spread initially. But now, as the infrastructure grows, it needs a way to create thousands of fake accounts to ensnarl thousands of more victims. Completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. Normally, CAPTCHA would be a brick wall for an amateur bot program, but Coopface has found a clever workaround. First, it sends the following command to Facebook. The login and password are encoded via an encrypted scheme that involves reading the letters, their corresponding AC values, and comparing that to a successive string of numbers from zero to one, to two, to three, to four, to... Encrypted becomes unencrypted. New account information is sent to the social media site. The social media site responds with another packet containing a blank bio, birthday, favorite books, activities. Kube autofills this with randomly generated info that feels just realistic enough. Next, the site will ask for CAPTCHA. To circumvent this, the CAPTCHA puzzle is mirrored to the desktop of any individual in its bot army. Two things happen. Their screen is unlocked, and the CAPTCHA for the new minion is complete. Coopface deploys this scheme a number of times. Millions of friend requests are sent across Facebook, and the army grows ever larger. Cyber investigators uncover an irregularity. The connection of interest is located on servers hosted by Coriax in the UK. The data flowing in and out of one of these servers matches observed data by Coopface. The command and control centers are wiped out and the bots are left wandering without direction. Hundreds of new command and control centers appear, which ushers in Coopface's peak with an estimated infected machines. The unraveling of Coopface is delivered through the very same websites it previously exploited. An Apache HTTP client is used to control files to and from a web server. For the most part, it can be functioned anonymously, unless a specific option is left untouched. This option will drop breadcrumbs that display to any visitor what type of files are being transferred to and from the botnet on the daily. This photo's metadata shows it was taken with an iPhone on September 15, 2009. This is a daily backup of the Kube Face command and control software. Inside, an IP stands out. This is programmed to automatically send a daily SMS update to five numbers. Updates that show exactly how much profit the network is pulling in. The numbers are searched. One is found. An online marketplace for vehicle sales. License plate in full view. Another market selling sphinxes. A name. is registered on a number of websites. The same BMW is found on Flickr, also the cab. One of the found email addresses on a social media page points to a corporate email called Mobsoft. The website is defunct, but the company details list in Anton K. Job listings. The numbers on it both match the PHP found in Coop. Their names are cross-referenced with their respective social media accounts. Here, they posted their vacation pictures publicly. Facebook doxes their full names and pictures. They are dubbed Alibaba and Four. And now, 
in a rather anticlimactic peak. The Coop Face Command and Control Centers simply go offline. From that point on to our current day and age, Coop Face's original Command and Control Center has never been reactivated. Alibaba and Four are off the grid. And the zombie army. Remains dormant. Got he! <laughs> Got he! <laughs> Good evening, citizens of the Metaverse, and welcome to the Electronic Simulation Showcase Show. Today, show. we're looking at the sports car of at-home virtual reality hardware, the Roto Chair. This gaming chair is specially designed to increase immersion in your favorite VR simulations. Plug in your HMD cables into the Grade A cable management system. When you turn your head in-game, the motorized chair will turn your entire body a full 360 degrees. The Roto is equipped with double rumble motors on the bottom and back sides, meaning every explosion, every windstorm will feel like you're actually there. Intense. Covered. Is the name of the game when you're kicking back and watching a film, flying through the vast cosmos, or shooting your way to victory. With full padding, it's like you're sitting on an immersive cloud, ready to reach the depths of the metaphysical simulational virtual virtual vir vir virtual transfigurational on realities. The Roto Chair, the world's first interactive VR chair. I joined a bunch of phone freakers who are gathering for a party. Something like two dozen people show up. Each one almost as much of a nerd as the worst of a ham radio enthusiast. The conversation inevitably gets around to one of my favorite targets, Cosmos. The Pacific Telephone Mission System that could bestow so much power on any freaker who could access it. As we started talking, I realize the building that houses Cosmos is nearby. The guard is a young guy. I say, hey, how you doing? We're out late, I work here, I wanted to show my friends where I work. He says, sure, just sign in. Doesn't even ask for an ID. Smooth. We've been calling departments and analyzing phone company operations for so long that we know exactly where the Cosmos employees work. Room 108. A folder on the wall holds up sheets of paper listing dial-up numbers for every wire center in Southern California. Armed with this list and login credentials, I'd have the ability to control any phone line in Pacific Telephone Southern California service area. Hello. I can't believe our luck. We should have left then. But I spot a set of Cosmos manuals and the temptation is irresistible. I tell the guys, let's take the manuals to a copy shop, run off a copy for each of us, then return the manuals before people start coming back to work in the morning. It was the most stupid decision of my early life. We drive around looking for a copy shop but can't find one. It's 2 a.m. So I take the manuals home with me. But I have a bad feeling about them. So I throw it all in some trash bags and give them to my accomplice. Tell him to throw them away or something. An unknown teenager has hacked a new network known as NORAD. It's an organization that provides aerospace warning and protection for North America. And this kid infiltrated the system 
just to have a look around. The move is so bold that it inspires the film War Games. A game? Or is it real? Journalist John Markoff gets in touch with Kevin. He wants him to be part of his new book on hackers, named Cyberpunk. He's gained a reputation as a master of social engineering. It's the art of deceiving people into sharing valuable and confidential information for fraudulent purposes. But he's not interested in the money on offer. He wants to maintain a low profile, so he refuses to be part of the book, much to the displeasure of John Markov. On a hot summer's day in LA, Kevin pulls out of the Stephen S. Wise Temple, where he works as a receptionist. In his rearview mirror, he thinks he sees a group of three men following him in a Ford Crown Victoria. He pulls a U-turn, and sure enough, they do the same. Kevin speeds down the I-405, and the car races after him. Suddenly, one of the men places a cop car flasher on the roof of the car, and now the sirens are crying out. Kevin pulls over. The officers rush up. They scream. Kevin is dragged out, handcuffed. His car is ransacked, but there's no signs of any bomb. <laughs> You're not gonna find it! He's hauled to the station. The officers don't find a logic bomb, but they know about a crime Kevin committed. A friend told the police everything. He's sentenced 12 months in prison, followed by three years of supervised release. He sits in the courtroom, betrayed and alone. His attorneys plead with a judge that his hacking is an addiction rather than criminal behavior. They say the young man needs help, not a prison cell. Kevin rises and pleads his case to the judge. By now, he's a veteran in deception. The judge agrees in order that Kevin serve his sentence in a halfway house for those with compulsive disorders. Kevin laughs as he's listening to the ruling. He was arrested for tricking his way into a computer system, and now he deceives the judge into thinking that he's the victim of his own crimes. It's a few weeks until supervised release ends, and the demon on his shoulder is whispering. He starts learning about Pacific Bell, a telephone company based in California. An idea appears. If he gets caught, he'll be sent to jail, but if he doesn't, then he'd have fooled the authorities right under their noses. No! Soon, he has all the passwords and credentials he needs to take control of the company's voicemails. Kevin is on the run for two years. He loses 100 pounds. When he learns that how a criminal walks is the number one way they're recognized, he puts pebbles in his shoes to change his stride. He uses over a dozen different names. His favorite is Eric Wise. He begins a crime spree that infiltrates the world's biggest companies, Nokia. The companies say the damage from the hacks totals. Kevin sips his coffee as he reads the paper, and suddenly, a chill passes down his spine. FBI agents take their positions outside the house in California. They see their target sitting inside. Burst in and draw their weapons, and the man denies that he's Kevin Mitnick. He's a Middle Eastern immigrant, doesn't even own a computer. More than 2,000 kilometers away in Seattle, Kevin throws his paper to the ground, his name emblazoned on the front page of the New York Times. Kevin is adamant the stories in the articles are lies. He never hacked into NORAD or wiretapped the NSA. But if you believe Kevin, then you shouldn't trust anything you've heard so far about Kevin. He takes on mythical status overnight. The little-known prankster is now public enemy number one of cyberspace. Kevin walks the streets of Seattle in a daze. Many of the passing faces on the sidewalk seem to be staring straight back at him. He hears the faint sound of a helicopter in the sky. He feels his heart beginning to thump. No one seems to notice the helicopter, but they do notice Kevin. He hurries into the courtyard of an apartment complex and uses the tall trees as cover, peering through the leaves. 
Kevin tosses a package into the bushes and bursts into a full-on sprint. He gets away. But from what? One of America's top cybersecurity experts is finalizing plans to leave for a ski vacation the next day. And suddenly, his own computer is hacked. His phone rings. Your security technique will be defeated. Your technique is no good. To someone like him, the attack and subsequent taunts are an act of war. He sets up a series of stealth monitoring posts and creates his own software to track the hacker. He waits in silence until the alarm is triggered. He traces the intruder to a computer modem connected to a cellular telephone somewhere on the East Coast. A man steps out onto his balcony in Raleigh, North Carolina, when suddenly a chill passes down his spine. The FBI agents take their positions outside the house. They see their target sitting inside. Journalist John Markoff watches from the street. The agents burst in and draw their weapons, but find nothing. The man furiously denies that he's Kevin Mitnick. He's so convincing, the FBI agents are about to leave. But then, an agent notices an old ski jacket in the cupboard. He empties the pockets, and out falls a paste-up. Legacy Media pitches up their circus tents outside. The most wanted computer hacker is behind bars. Kevin shares one large holding cell with 60 other inmates. He doesn't eat for two days because the food isn't kosher. Inside, all eyes are fixed on the defendant. Kevin is charged with 14 counts of wire fraud, eight counts of possession of unauthorized access devices, interception of wire or electronic communications, and causing damage to a computer. When Kevin is led away from the court, Tsutomu calls out from the front row. Kevin looks back at his nemesis, the one man who finally saw through the lies and deceptions to find him. He nods, says nothing, and walks away. His appeals for bail are churned down by every single court in the U.S., including the Supreme. Kevin says the beefed-up charges are an injustice and his treatment is a denial of his constitutional rights. But why won't anyone believe him? He has one last idea. But then, a group of officers storm into the cell and throw him into solitary confinement. It might change a lot of things in a, in a negative way. I mean, he's trying so hard to, to get a, to, to at least get a trial, and then this comes up. Christmas Day passes without incident. The hack on Yahoo was a hoax carried out by members of the Free Kevin movement. There was no logic bomb. After four years of prison and solitary confinement, Kevin pleads guilty to four counts of wire fraud, two counts of computer fraud, and one count of illegally intercepting a wire communication. Uh, I didn't think of the consequences when I was engaging in this behavior. I just did it. I'd, I'd, I'd copy the code, store it on a computer, and go right on to the next without even reading the code. Interesting. You know, and that could be a complete different motivation of somebody who's really out for financial gain or a foreign uh, country or a competitor trying to right. obtain, you know, uh, information like, you know, like economic espionage, for instance. Right. You know, I hate to suggest a waste of your talent, but as I listen to you, I think you'd make a great lawyer. Well, uh, I don't know if you're convicted of a felony if they'd allow That's you to harder, be admitted to the bar. To do. <laughs> Kevin Mitnick is released from prison after nearly five years. When 
Kevin was on his crime spree, his hacking exploits seemed like mythology to the outside world. But by the time the sun hits his face, the world needs his skills. So soon after his release, he testifies before the Senate and advises on how to better protect computer systems from attacks. So I really like sleep, and the thing that I do like about sleep is that it's an alternate reality. Nothing is impossible in sleep. <clears throat> when you dream, you can fly, and you can also die. You can laugh and you can cry. You can sing, but you won't notice a thing because you're asleep. I feel like sleep is a transportation to a new world for eight or less hours, or maybe even more. So, uh, sleep is very nice to have. I feel like it's a privilege because some other people, they don't have the access to sleep because of things like insomnia, so I feel like you should never take sleep for granted because if you stay up, uh, I think you're gonna stay up for a long time, so sleep is very good for the body, and it's awesome. I was disrupted. Boop, 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 boop.